What the Tech is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks, with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. What the Tech. Hey everybody, welcome to What the Tech, I'm Andrew Zarian, I'm joined by the one, the only, Mr. Therat.com himself, Paul Therat, how you doing, Paul? That is a beautiful hat. I think funny hats is going to be my new thing. Now, that's not a real hat, it's like one of the Logitech filters, right, in the in the <laughs> cam is, settings? No, it's a real hat. That's amazing. That is a gigantic hat. Yep. Where would one get a hat like that? <laughs> I don't know, where do you get this hat? Target. Target. That's amazing. That's an amazing, gigantic hat. Uh, the man of many hats, Paul Therat. <laughs> so it's not an actual pirate hat. <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? It's a bootleg pirate hat. Uh, Paul nice. is in Seattle right now because Paul was at the Microsoft event, the Windows 10 event that happened uh, a couple days ago. A lot mm -hmm. of exciting. So you've been there. You've been, I mean, you left on Tuesday. Yep. So you're still there. You're not leaving until Monday. So you're going to spend the weekend there. But. Man, I have to tell you, when did Microsoft become the exciting company? <laughs> when did Apple, you know, kind of become... Well, that was about 1995, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when Windows 95 happened. Um, holy, you know, I have to tell you, I was very impressed by the event. It was a little long, yeah. but a yeah, lot of the stuff we already knew. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a big that, surprise. Aside from a few details, most of the Windows 10 features that they showed off we knew about and they could have spent about two hours less time talking about Cortana. They're very, they're very taken with Cortana. They, they are. And you uh, know what? Cortana is much better than Siri by their demo. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's kind of a low bar. And I, I don't know. I That kind of I, – I think we're going to wake up one day and that kind of interaction is going to be very natural and, and is going to work great. But, I, I mean, I think for, for now um, they're kind of shoehorning it into legacy UIs and it's, you know, it's fine. It's, yeah. it's okay. But um, – they, I don't know. they really pushed Cortana. You're right. And the other thing they really pushed was informing us over and over again that these features are going to be rolled out over the next several months. So Microsoft has, uh, you know, been criticized by some. I'm not going to name any names, me, uh, and uh, <laughs> and other people, um, you know, for not being clear about how that stuff happens. And I think this time they wanted to say, look, you know, we're having this event, and then maybe today or in the next couple of days, we're going to release a new build. And not everything you see here is going to be in that build. Right? Some of it will be a month from now, two months from now, um, which you know I think is nice of them to be very clear about. And I prefer to see that stuff, you know, uh, even if we're not going to get it right away. So where do we begin about this event? Um, Windows. Let's 10. talk about the price first. Let's do price. Okay, so it's That's free. The fun one for the first year. It's free, but there's an asterisk. You know? uh, for the first year, for Windows Seven, eight point one, and uh, eight customers. I guess I don't know why you would be on eight if you have the option to go to 8.1 um actually this, i don't think it is eight i think it is literally 8.1 it's only 8.1 okay yeah. so you're gonna have to upgrade to 8.1 to do this it's it, it's the late it's, it's weird it's just, there, there's one vague area here but it's basically the latest version of the os in each case so it's windows 7 with service pack one it's windows 8.1 right not windows 8 okay so windows 7 with service pack one right okay you know which is kind of a low bar yeah. itself um windows 8.1 Windows Phone 8.1, although in a separate post, um, the Lumia Conversations guys noted that or said that uh, most Windows Phone 8-based Lumias would also be getting the update. So I don't know if that's Lumia-specific. Um, okay. Or if that, that's their kind of casual way of suggesting that they found a way around the carriers because th there are questions about the pricing. But let me actually let me step back before I go to that. Um, so free as an upgrade, right? Free and I think the point here is not that you as an individual qualify for an upgrade because you have some computer. It's that this computer can be upgraded for free. Yeah. And so if you have multiple computers, they can all, all, all of them will be upgraded. Okay. It's not so here, here's my question to you. Mm -hmm. Do you lose that existing license that you have for Windows 7 or Windows 8.1? I don't know. Um, there's nothing stopping you from... So m most PCs, you know, if you buy a PC in a store, the that product key can't be reused, 
right? It cannot, no. You can't, you can't take a Windows 7 product key off of a retail PC and, and use it somewhere else. Um, so my answer is, they haven't said this explicitly, but would be no, because you could always restore that thing back to Windows 7, right? You could either, it's on the disk still, or use the restore disk they gave you, and that thing would auto uh, register, you know, auto uh, activate with the Windows 7 key they gave you. Yeah. That's never going to change. Okay. But if you want to um, go back down to 7, you can. Sure. Okay. Sure. Because here, so here's there, my scenario, right? Like I, okay. like many people, uh, yep. Microsoft says it's one ID per computer, right? Even when you buy a copy of Windows 7, it, you could only technically install it on one PC. Well, actually, you know, le legally, um, you can remove Windows 7. If you purchase Windows 7 at retail, uh, not an OEM version, not a system builder edition, but a, yeah. like a retail version of Windows. It doesn't matter which version. Um, and it's, and wanted to reuse that on a different computer. Uh, you could do that. You'd have to voice activate it, meaning you'd have to call them. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to tell them that you, what you did, and then they would, or you, you know, just, at their discretion. But they, yeah. they in fact, always do it. Yeah. Um, would activate it on the new computer. Yeah, so... But you have to, like, technically, you can't run it on two machines at the same time. You can, the but... Same, the same product key. The same product key on, on two separate machines. Right. You're That's not true. supposed yeah. to do that. But it, yep. you can. I mean, it, it works. So if I upgrade to Windows 8 on one, what happens yep. to that product key? What happens to the activation on the other machine? Nothing. That, you, this nothing. is the voice activation okay. scheme. In other words, they're not, they're not tracking an old product key. Uh, you know, they're not thinking about that. The goal... Yeah. Most people don't have this kind of concern. You no, know, you, most people are just you, buying it and installing it. You have a computer, and now you upgrade it. You're not thinking about, oh, could I reuse this valuable asset I have in the form of a product key? Like, yeah. you know, you just, you're, you're upgrading. Um, but there are a bunch of caveats and a few questions about this process, too, because, first of all, this is a special one-year promotion. So whenever yeah. Windows 10 ships, this freebie update is going to be available for one year. Yeah. We don't know what happens after that. We don't know if... There will be a uh, non-upgrade version of Windows 10 that you could buy for some reason. Yeah, uh, I'm sure I, there will be OEM versions. I mean, but. this is their way to say, you know, within within the next, you know, six months, they're going to say, look, 34% of our, you know, Windows-based customer has moved over 50% or 60%. You know, it's a numbers thing for them. They want people over to the new operating system. Yes. And, 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 and I want to be really clear about that part of it because that's not just – it's not like a bragging rights thing, right? It is important for people to get to the latest version of this thing. It is important that we get past the old way of doing things, yeah. right? That where people are stuck on some old version of Windows XP or whatever it is, and they just can't move beyond that. And so one of the ways they can do that is to erase the financial burden of it, right? One of the other ways they can do it is to make sure that the upgrade process is as seamless and, and you know doable as possible, and we'll see how that goes. And then one of the other ways they can do it is to release a Windows version that is applicable and acceptable to the, these audiences, right? That coming from it from Windows 7, you like this upgrade. It's, it has a start menu. It looks and works the way you want it to. Coming from Windows 8, one, same thing, et cetera. Um, so there are a lot of questions. I mean, the, the point was they didn't come out with the, the full-blown, here, here's, the, here's the retail pricing schedule, here's how it's going to work. Here's, you know, they, What they want to do is get people thinking about this thing's going to come out and you can get it for free and you have a year to do it. And they're hoping that most people on those systems will do it, right? Yeah. Um, because they do want people to be on the latest version. There's a lot of compatibility uh, and security and reliability issues around people on older versions of Windows, older versions of IE, and they're trying to fix that kind of stuff. Um, and what they want people to think of this thing going forward is Windows as a service where we don't worry about version numbers anymore, but everyone's just up to date. It's, up to, it's constantly um, updating, yeah. Now, one of the other confusing bits, uh, I guess, I didn't. This didn't occur to me, but when, once someone prompted me with this question, I realized this will be a common question: is, you know, what happens uh, after uh, this upgrade period? I mean, do I start having to pay for Windows 10? Like, is it a once a year subscription fee? I mean, so you're giving it to me for free, but does that mean I have to start subscribing? Yeah, because the wording was interesting, right? It's free for the first year. Well, yeah, generally, you see not, that with subscription services. Yeah, so it's not it's not a subscription service. Yeah. It's uh, you get it when you get it for free, you have it forever for free. And by forever, I actually mean the lifetime, actually of the OS, not the device. But Microsoft said the device. It's the the active support lifecycle of the software, which is ten years. Um, for ten years, you can use this thing on that device for free. I mean, and but 
there's a there's another caveat in there, and this and I asked them about this because this was very strangely worded. My belief is based both on how they worded it and on the feedback that I got from Microsoft directly is that if you accept this free upgrade as an individual, this is not for businesses, this is for people, you also must agree that you will let Microsoft update that system every month with all of the Windows updates that they put out. Ah. So I, what hap- how do you how do how do you agree to that? What happens if you're offline? How do you, yeah, like how or, do you avoid what well, happens if we're not when Okay, again, avoid not that? a lot of details, yeah. right? Um, if you are part of the Windows Insider program and you're using new, well, any actually, it's not any, it's not newer builds, any builds. I, I think one of the stipulations to this program is you have to let Microsoft update your system uh, every month or whenever the updates come out. You know, and and, I, and we're talking uh, secure, you know, important security updates, yeah. not like, hey, this new version of Zune or something. You know, it's yeah. it's security updates. You know, stuff that's important to the system. The idea being that we all move forward together. Uh, as one, right? We're always on, there isn't, you know, Bob over here is an XP with Service Pack 2 and Mike over there has got Windows 7, but he doesn't have Service Pack 1. And you all have different versions of DLLs and system files. And, you know, this is security vulnerability and you have to have different fixes for each version of the OS. Like Microsoft wants everybody on the same system. They want to stop thinking about this stuff, you know, as uh, the old way of doing things is over, that kind of thing. Um, My belief is that in the future, they will document how this is going to happen. And, that you'll basically find that um, you don't have a lot of say over the critical security updates, that that's going to ha- just happen. And I think that's how it's going to work. So right I'm sure now, people will write workarounds that get rid of that. I'm sure. But right now, you could stuff. actually turn off automatic updates. That That's a setting in You can Windows. do anything you want. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Is that no longer going to exist? I, you know, again, I don't yeah. know. You know, I, I, but yes, I think so. I think what's going to happen is there'll still be a Windows update and there will still be optional updates. There will still be updates that this month are kind of optional or they're important, but then maybe next month they become mandatory. You know, they'll, they'll still have that kind of a schedule, but those uh, monthly patch Tuesday or zero day types, you know, critical security uh, updates, my belief. And again, I, this was supported by a short conversation I had with someone from Microsoft about this topic will be mandatory. And that's going to be the deal. And I, it won't surprise me if they do the same thing with, say, a retail version of Windows. You yeah. know, that if you were to go into a store and buy Windows 10, uh, you know, it's got, by the way, you know, part of that little YOLO that no one reads, you are going to let us update this thing because we can't afford to have all these zombie PCs sitting out there. Yeah. And, you know, you may think you know better than everyone else, but we're going to, sorry, we're going to we're going to keep this thing up to date. I would love to know what the punishment is. Like, does it lock you out and say you have to do these updates right now or else you're not going to no, no, not, start no. it? No, so I, I don't know. There's not going to be any, like, punitive thing. <laughs> I, I think the way the way it works now is, uh, you know, if you have your system set up, like, by default, which is... Automatic uh, everything. Automatic. You know, yeah. what you'll discover sometimes is that you'll step back to the computer and it will be on the lock screen maybe or even just in Windows. And there'll be a message that says, hey, by the way, um, these security updates have to be installed. You need to reboot, so please shut down your applications. And you can you can put it off for a little while, you know, a day or something. But eventually, whether you want it to or not, that thing's going to reboot, and those things are getting installed. And that's just the way it has to be. And um, the other half of this, by the way, is phone, right? So they they announced that Windows 10 will be a free upgrade for Windows Phone, and everyone's going to get this thing. If you're on Windows Phone 8.1, which is most of the user most base, people, yeah. Uh, if you have a Lumion Windows 8, yeah, that and that's actually literally virtually almost everybody. Um, we're just going to give this to you, which is cute because Microsoft can't deliver updates to Windows. Yeah, so how are they so going to give it to you? I asked them that question and they said, well, I said, they said here's what I can tell you. Uh, we are going to do it and uh, we have a plan to make that work and we're going to talk about that at Build, which is in late April. I mean, they do so, have uh, a way now, right, through their developer program. Well, so they have two things they can do now. One is actually, and this never gets any press, but uh, Microsoft and I assume other um, like mobile platform makers have the ability to deliver critical security fixes directly to users, bypassing the carriers. It's a, it's a just a requirement of that agreement. They have to be able to do that. Obviously, the zero day flaw, whatever. And then Microsoft does have that developer program, yes. I, I don't think Microsoft's going to do something as squirrely as, uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, if you could just sign up for the developer program and pretend you're a developer, yeah. you can get the latest version of the OS. Like, they're going to have some legitimate... Something, yeah. Something, and I don't know what that is. And and we'll I, I, I Listen, that that's great news because it's just another step forward in the right direction and maybe Android will follow, you know? 
Mm-hmm. You know, th- this is just the next step. It- it's silly that the carriers kind of hold us over our heads when it comes to the device. Can you imagine if Verizon, I mean, Verizon Files did that? Said, well, you're connected to the internet through us, so we're not going to let you upgrade Windows <laughs> sure. unless, unless well, way, we uh, push uh, it out. Let's push, let's okay. turn that conversation around slightly because Ver- Verizon is a great example. Um, Verizon, you sign up for as a subscriber to Verizon. No one ever pays attention to the agreement you have with them. But one of the things that Verizon can do is update that cable box that's in your living room. They can update your router. They can update that whatever that other weird box is that's out by that you know between your house and the street. The ONC. Has, um, the ONC. Yeah. Yeah. Th- this stuff. They they uh, this is exactly what Microsoft wants to do for Windows, right? Have the ability to transparently make sure that you are not a risk to yourself and others, right? <laughs> that <laughs> that this isn't about you know let's uh, let's throw a new photo editor on their computer that will be hilarious. It's about getting the system up to date from a yeah. security We're standpoint. We're not talking driver you know, updates. Well, next yeah. Tuesday when Google releases another couple of Windows flaws without telling anybody, you know, ahead of time, um, they want to be ready so they can, you know, uh, you know, keep you know, keep it. Do you think know, this is a positive? Keep people secure. Do you think something like this is 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 yep. very yep. good because I know people are going to say, "Well, I don't want Microsoft forcing me to do these updates. We don't know what they're going to do to the you know PC." What? I'm going to hear from those people and I get it. But you know what? This is not 1985. It, this is time to move into the modern world with open eyes. Um, this is like people saying, you know, I, I don't like to move away from carburetors because I was able to fix my own car. You know, it's like, guys, seriously, <laughs> like there, there are seriously important reasons for moving to the system. Yeah, I agree I, with you. Yeah. I mean, I, this goes back 15 years or something, but I remember uh, I was working on a book about the then current version of Windows, and I'm not going to say which one it was. I don't want to, you know, uh, highlight who this person is, but we were talking about the security aspects of it and uh, Windows Update and yada, yada, yada. And he said to me, you know, our, we, we need to be on the same page with our what our advice is to readers about this thing. And, and, and what that advice is, is you turn off all automatic updating. Uh, you, uh, make, you research each of these updates as they come in yourself. You wait a month at least before you install any of these things. I mean, and yeah, I, was like, I get that. But I, I get am not that. writing that. <laughs> no, but listen, no, Paul, but, I, I get that in, in Windows 98 – I get that in in Windows yeah. uh, Windows XP. I mean, that's really you know what. But it was I don't know. So here, here's the thing: there 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 are two groups here. There's the type of people who are listening to this podcast or who read my website or whatever, and and they're technical and they they do have a a deep understanding of how this stuff works. And maybe they do need to make those kinds of decisions in a workplace or something. Or, um, but the the truth is, the vast majority of people using Windows are just average consumers. They're my mother, my sister, my brother. They're people who are not technical in any way, shape, or form. And they are way better off allowing that kind of thing just to happen. Um, they can still make decisions about updates if they want, but yeah. I can assure you none of those people I just mentioned could ever even find Windows Update, even let alone understand what it was. Absolutely. But if they wanted to, they could still go in there and install that photo editor or the you know, silver light or whatever kind of baloney that they're not going to force on you. Um, but you know this stuff it's too deep seated this is like os level stuff you know uh, the notion that microsoft ships you some uh, disk that has a bunch of files on it and there's like thousands and thousands of files and most of them are like dlls and kind of system files of various kinds and one of them has a security vulnerability 18 months later or 2 years later or 6 years later and you're stand you're going to stand there with your hands on your hips and say nope this is my computer now you're not touching this thing um, this is an outdated notion. You know, this is this is not the place to take a stand. You know, that's just dumb. So anyway, yes, the long, long story short, um, this is a good move. It's an overdue move. I think when you look at it in tandem with other things they're doing, like forcing the um, retirement of older IE versions um, and moving everyone forward to the more secure, more reliable, more current code base, makes sense. And you can't make the complaint that they're only doing this because they want to sell you on the next thing. Absolutely. Right? Well, I'll give you an example. I have, because I, they're I, giving it away. In, uh, in, when I was doing IT, I was not allowed. There was a strict rule from corporate. I was not allowed to upgrade IE. They did not want me to upgrade IE. That, I mean, it was the right. craziest thing. The, I, we well, were on, no, it, but it's, God knows, this is very common. IE 7. I mean, we were on like IE 6 even. Like they did not want me to upgrade IE. And it's because that business relied on the compatibility of some web apps or yeah, internet that's site what it or whatever was. it was. 
That's what happens. You know, so and, what's going to happen now when Microsoft says, "Listen, there's a critical update. You have to leave IE seventy. You have whatever whatever the version is at the time." Well, that's what I'm saying. That that they've already so the IE aspect of this they actually announced last year. They're gonna they're not going to allow that. And so they have a. Uh, I think it's just it's not compatible. It's a enterprise enterprise mode or a administrator. I think it's enterprise mode or something. Basically, what they're doing is building something into IE that. Um, will allow it to emulate older versions of the browser. And of course, in Windows 10, they're splitting IE into two products. So they'll have the legacy thing on one side and then uh, the hot goodness on the other side, however you want to say it. But um, they're just not going to they're not going to put up with that anymore. Yeah. It's just too... IE has is, is arguably ruined Windows. All of these stupid old versions of IE that are still floating around. You know, IE 6 on Windows XP was this is like this zombie that's been sitting out there and it's still <laughs> probably on tens of millions oh of Oh my computers. God, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, crazy. I can tell you many uh, corporate companies are still on IE6. It, it's insanity. It's why IE6? So, why that one? Yeah. Uh, uh, it, yeah. It's it, it was an interesting announcement. Now, uh, I want to talk about Windows Phone, obviously, and what the direction mm -hmm. is with that. I want to talk about the Xbox because they said, you know, the underlying sure. operating system yep. is going to be Windows 10 on the Xbox. Yep. But what's going on with Push RT? <laughs> it's dead, right? I mean, that's it. It's yeah, it, it's a, yeah, clearly it's dead. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> it's kind of it's, it's funny because they haven't explicitly said anything about Windows RT. I asked the question during the Q and A. So, what about Windows RT? I apparently I completely misunderstood what he told me because uh, I thought he said that Windows 10 RT would get the Windows 10 upgrade, but what he said was that Windows 10 would get an upgrade um, that is not Windows 10. So. It's not getting Windows 10. Okay. Microsoft issued a statement afterwards trying to clarify it, but they only talked about their Surface devices, not about Windows RT devices in general. I think if you were to look at the body of Windows RT devices out in the world, Surface probably represents 90 or 95% of them. So the notion that they're going to only provide Surface with a couple of updates and then ship Windows 10 on other RT devices is ridiculous. It's fair to say that Windows RT is dead. Okay. Um, today, this morning, I don't know if you saw this story, but uh, Surface 2 disappeared from the Microsoft store hmm. uh, this morning. I'm guessing there wasn't a run on Surface 2 devices. I don't think anyone would have looked at this week's news and thought, well, I got to pick up one of those yeah. uh, dead enders today, you know. So clearly this thing is gone. Um, uh, and by this thing, I mean both Windows RT itself and then the Surface 2 line, the, the RT Surface line. Okay, so this also, what does this mean for ARM devices? The, the future of, you know, Windows and ARM, is that also gone at this point? So it's hard to say. Um, there are uh, probably, I guess, hundreds of millions of Windows Phone devices in the world today that uh, qualify for this upgrade. They are all running ARM. That means that there will be ARM versions of Windows 10, right, yeah. for those devices, because they'll be updated to Windows 10 2, you know, Windows 10 for phone and small tablet. Um, my, I, you know, I don't like, I, they, they didn't explicitly discuss this. And there are events coming up where they might. You know, there's a WinHack event, which is a hardware event. There's a Build event, which is a developer event. And, of course, there's um, uh, Ignite, which used to be TechEd, which is a, an enterprise event. And, and I think over the course of this time, we're going to get more clarity here. If I, if I were to guess just based on the information I have, um, I would guess that hardware makers can ship absolutely phones and probably any device with a screen smaller than 8 inches running on ARM that will get Windows that 10. Will, that will get Windows 10. Okay, because not yeah. a lawyer in our chat room says, does anyone know the technical reason why RT ARM tablets cannot run Windows 10 when other smaller ARM tablets will? Yep. And I'll, uh, actually, it's, I don't know if it's a technical reason, but I'll tell you what I think is the reason. Um, it's the desktop. Yeah. And so on those computers, on those devices, I should say, there will be no desktop. It's going to be a Windows phone type UI. It's been updated with kind of a, a Windows 10 look and feel. It's been updated with the ability to run a universal apps that are common between the two, I don't want to call them platforms, but the, you know, the two sides yeah. of the platform, right? Um, in other words, you know, the music app, the people app, the calendar app, the mail app, um, the photos app, a, lot, a bunch of the apps, the Xbox app, um, are the same app, right? When you run it on a small tablet, smaller than eight inches, it's always going to be full screen. There is no option to expose the desktop and run that thing. In and why window. would you really, right? I mean, m most people right. would not even think about doing sure. that. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I mean, you know, some people would. Some, some people, people would. Okay. There's always those people, <laughs> you know. I want to um, type they, away on, uh, yep. you know. Sure. 
So they're not, no well, pain. they may be able to type away, but they're not, what they're not going to be able to do is run it in a window. Yeah. Um, on a device that has a screen that's eight inches or bigger, you will have the option to attach a keyboard and mouse, run those things on the desktop in windowed mode. Although by default, if you're in a, in a tablet form factor, they'll run full screen, right? Like they do today in Windows 8.1. Yeah. Uh, you can optionally you can you can expose the desktop and the taskbar if you want to that you can do it as long as it's eight inches or bigger. Okay, so here's a question: What if I have an eight inch or bigger tablet and I want the UI to be like Windows Phone? Is that is that going to be it, something? Yeah. Is, so that, is not, that going to be a reality? Ex- that I don't know. I, I'm going to guess and say no. It's not going to be exactly Windows Phone. So uh, the difference is this: uh, when on Smaller than eight inches, the feeling is you will hold that thing primarily in portrait mode. That's how the start screen will be oriented, like it is on Windows Phone. You will, you know, obviously you can rotate it for reading, for watching movies, for whatever. Once you get to eight inches and up, the feeling is you're not really going to use it in portrait mode all that much, although it will switch, right, again, in the flip side. Uh, But you will typically use it in in that kind of landscape mode. And uh, it will have that the uh, the taskbar will be there. Um, again, if you're in tablet mode, it will be full screen by default, but you can switch it. You know, you you have that opportunity to go to the desktop. Yeah, this is interesting because um, I would like if I had an iPad size device. What is it? Nine point eight inch. Mm-hmm. What's what's the iPad size? Nine nine seven. Nine seven. If I have a Windows device like that, yeah. I I personally would not mind the Windows Phone UI. Right. So the the difference between an iPad and a Windows device of the same rough size is that most of those Windows devices are actually going to be widescreen devices, not 4x3. And when you put them into portrait mode, they, they, there's a weird effect where they look all stretched out. And so you can do that if you want. It doesn't matter. And of course, device makers can make 4x3 devices, 3x2 devices. They can do whatever they want there too. So you'll you'll see some of that. You could use that thing in portrait mode by default. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like. I, I, my guess is you will actually see the full screen start experience that you see on a PC, meaning it won't be Windows Phone, meaning that it will still scroll horizontally even though you're holding it in portrait. Um, but, you know, again, we just don't have – this is just based on what I understand. I, you know, the, some of this could be wrong, but I, this is my understanding. Um, by default, those things, the apps you run will run full screen, which makes sense for tablet, uh, portrait or, or, you know, or landscape, just like today. Uh, but you'll have the opportunity to tap somewhere and, and have it be windowed and show the taskbar yeah. and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's up to you. You know, it's yeah. up to the person. And there's so many questions here. And and we're going to continue with this. And if you guys have questions, uh, like like I said, not a lawyer had a question. I asked it. If you guys have questions, mm-hmm. uh, send it our way because I it may remind me of something I want to ask Paul. I'm going to continue this, but let's take a little break and thank our longtime sponsor, Audible. We haven't spoken about Audible in a long time, Paul. That's true. If you're looking for an audiobook, uh, I'm a big fan of audiobooks. I've been traveling a lot, and I just load up on a bunch of audiobooks. Uh, most of the time, you know what I do? I'll get like three or four of them, and I don't even finish one. You know, like <laughs> I'll finish one, sure. like coming back between flights, going from New York to California. But I'll buy like I'll get like three, four of them, thinking like, oh, I'll get through all of these on on the trip, and I forget it's like a five hour flight, and I'm not like going by boat to Europe. Uh, right. Audible, but uh, audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. You get your free audio book there. Paul always has a great aud- Audible pick. And uh, <laughs> I, Paul, what's your audio pick? Audible pick. So <laughs> I'm still getting, it's funny, I'm, I'm still getting through some of the horror books I bought over Halloween because they had like a huge sale. So I have like this like 20, you know, horror books. And, you did a bunch uh, of Stephen I, King's. Yeah, a bunch of Stephen King's. And uh, actually, some of the other ones I got that were really good uh, Frankenstein uh, with uh, Dan Stevens, um, Psycho. Uh, the book version, which is actually kind of interesting to compare to the to the movie The Exorcist, which is actually amazing. But but recently, what I've been listening to is Audible has for a long time had all of the James Bond books available, right, in Audible format. But last year, I think at some point, they released new versions of each one of the books, and they're all read by some famous British person, usually an actor, right. And uh, so I, I've listened to the first couple of those. The first one is the first James Bond book is Casino Royale, and uh, that one is also read by Dan Stevens, and he's the the blonde guy that used to be on um, Downton Abbey. Yeah, and he's just got that awesome British voice. And what I would say is the, the James Bond books are interesting historically because they were all written in the 50s, 60s. Are you a Bond um, fan? 
Yeah. Okay. I've read all these books uh, multiple times. I read the. I have. I in fact, I still have them in paperback form in my home. Um, I've listened to a bunch of them in, on Audible before, and now these new versions have come out. And I think that honestly, it's kind of like when Stephen Fry reads The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He's just the right. Con- he's you know, the he's right guy. Perfect. Yeah. 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 You know, a guy like Dan Stevens is the right guy for Casino Royale. And this is kind of a cute bit at the end after the book's over. He talks about what it was like to, you know, uh, do this and and what his knowledge of the Bond stuff was. Um, he just has the right voice for it. But uh, Casino Royale in particular is one of the better books in the series. I mean, some of them, because of the age they were written, they veer off into weird, very casual racism and some... They're, they're not as... Um, you know, epic and huge as the movies are. They're, they're actually kind of small, self-contained stories. Uh, but if you're a fan of the movie Casino Royale, the, the fairly recent one they did, um, the, the book is part of that story that's in the movie. It's Casino not the Royale was a prequel, though, right? N- what, what do you mean? Was it, it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't like a sequel in the series. It was like how he it, became no, it's, the, it's literally the first book in the series it's the first book in the series it's the but, introduction to yeah. the character but in the movie in the movie side it, it's not it's the first well in the movie story. what they did was they they had a scene in the yeah. beginning where they showed how he got his 007 designation that's actually not in the book yeah uh, the, the book is about the whole uh, casino portion of the the movie where it's about him and Lashif and and uh, that kind of thing and and it's it's really again it's it's a small it's only about five hours five and a half hours something like that five hours um it's it's just a great it's a great combination of it's a good story it's nice it's digestible easy, um, it's one of the better books in the Bond series and then the the reading is fantastic it's just great, and so I don't know what there's a whole new series of these so there are two versions of every James Bond book now so the ones you want are the ones that have the black and white album art, okay. uh, they're all very distinctive looking now um, it's just, it's just, that's just a really good one that, that I got to tell Jess because out of all people she really got into Bond. <laughs> and she actually started reading Casino Royale. Oh, okay. So I and and she's not like I. I was so surprised. So I got to tell her to get it on audiobook because I'm I'm sure she would really enjoy I, that. The, the reading is just fantastic. Yeah. It's really really well done. Yeah, she went on this whole kick and she was making like the Bond martini and what he puts in it. <laughs> I oh, think- so I mean, so actually, this is in the movie, but um, you know, when the, it, everyone knows the whole shake and not stir thing, but. In the original book, that's not what he drinks. He has a he's a, he's very particular about everything. The Bond books are notable for a number of reasons. There's a lot of travelogue type stuff. There's a lot of um, fine food, fine wine, fine you know that kind of stuff. He's, he drinks a Vesper, right? That's his drink. It's a Vesper, is yeah. That, you're right. That, so that it's in the movie, but it's also in the book. And so the the whole martini shake and not stir thing uh, doesn't occur in Casino Royale. This is you know that happens uh, later in the books. Yeah, it's uh, what's in a Vesper? It's gin, it's vodka, and it's what is it like Lillette? Kina Lillette, something like that. I don't know. What, I don't even know what Lillette is. I, I just know because she went on this James Bond kick and she was like really into sure. it. And and she got it from the book. So that's really funny. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. Uh, this is actually a great pick. Great pick. Very excited about it. Uh, get your free audiobook <laughs> by going there. And uh, thanks to Audible for supporting What the Tech. Uh, so continue down my journey with Paul and me asking him all these crazy questions about Windows 10. Um, so they didn't mention RT by name, did they? At all? Not even once. Not even, Not once. even once. Okay. I, I mean, this is the right move, really. I, R- RT was a yeah, bizarre little I, I, obviously experiment. Obviously, there are people out there who bought these devices. Uh, you always hear from the one guy who's like, I, I don't know why you complain about this thing all the time. It works great. And um, I feel bad for those people because it doesn't work great, and that's wrong. But, you know, whatever. It's when, Whether you're talking Surface RT, Surface 2, or, um, you know, some other RT device. I guess there were two or three of them. Um, I think of these things as appliances. You know, they're not – I don't indignation over getting the – the next major version of Windows is sort of understandable, but I think the audience that this thing targeted, by and large, doesn't really think about that stuff. So yeah. the types of people that are upset about this are kind of the more technical types, uh, the early adopters, you know, kind of wanted just to try it because it was new and different and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, you know, I, I sort of get it, but I just don't see this being, this is the right thing to do. I mean, RT was a way to nudge Intel into doing the right thing with mobile processors, and they did. And so it took three years, but now we have Broadwell, 
and we don't need Windows RT anymore. We don't need Windows and R. Have they started shipping it? Devices. Have they started shipping the Broadwell on anything right now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what about non Lumia devices? How how are they going to be upgraded? They never said so. Okay. Uh, they did not say. Uh, it will. I mean, the updating will occur the same way it occurs on Lumias. But I mean, I, I think the 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 promise here is that if you're on Windows Phone eight one, you will get it. Right. If you're on a Lumia, they said basically if you're on Windows Phone 8, uh, you'll get it. I mean, capabilities will vary from device to device based on how much RAM, uh, what sensors you have, the screen technology, the camera technology, all that kind of stuff. But, um, I, I, you know, we'll see. They're, they kind of just threw that out there. It was a real general statement, and then we're not talking about it again until April. So, yeah, I we'll think uh, I think Mary Jo Foley said something like there's a plan and it's going to be announced yeah. soon. So. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. This is very exciting stuff. Um, have they the UI? I mean, the UI looks great. I really like the the charms bar is gone. It's like this notification bar on the side that looks really I nice. Any no one cried a tear for the charms. No, nobody. You, <laughs> you know, know, I, I there wasn't a single person there. It was like, first of all, oh, I kinda like the they mentioned the char they mentioned the charm bar, and I was like, oh no, it's still there. Like, yeah, like yeah. I, I was dreading the moment he says, like, oh, look, it's even more functional, but it's no longer a charm bar. It's, it's a notification menu on the side. Uh, yep. It looks great. Uh, I really like the start menu. That looks great, too. I like that you could either go, like, full screen with the start menu or, you know, yes. like, you have the option to do that. By the way, so you may I, uh, people probably forget this, but there's some time ago I reported that uh, Microsoft would, would get rid of the start screen and that what they would instead let you do is make the start menu go full screen. And then, of course, in early builds of Windows 10, there was a very clear option. You could go back and forth between start screen and start menu. And it was like, oh, Paul, you said that they were going to have this one thing. And actually, the thing they have now is what I was describing earlier on. It's really just, I mean, they'll just call it start, right? It's the start menu because they want to make Windows 7 people happy. But it's just start. Yeah. You can click a button, it goes full screen. You can click a button, it's a menu. And it, it's not like a flip a switch thing like it is to in, in the earlier builds. It's just one thing. Uh, here's another question for you, Paul. Uh, Hellcat M in our chat room says, uh, are they going to keep special updates like denim and black for Lumia or will they, will everybody get those updates? I don't know about that. I mean, so the denim black stuff is, uh, are, are specific Lumia features, right? Uh, firm, like, firmware is a tough thing. I, I, they're, they're sort of like, um, uh, features that relate to something that is in the hardware. Obviously on a Lumia device, you can, you know, you control the hardware. So, uh, if there's a camera in there, you can you want to update that camera software, and that's very particular to that device. You know, other hardware makers do the same thing. It's just that Nokia and now Microsoft do a lot more of it. So yeah. they usually uh, Nokia did uh, during I don't know the past couple of years, I guess, um, starting with you know amber black, uh, cyan, now denim, denim, <laughs> denim. Got um, a They should call denim bastards. Yeah. Anyway, they should. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In honor of you. Uh, By the way, that the was you, one. right? That boo. <laughs> that was that was you booing when they yeah. talked and they spoke about the yep. Seahawks. Okay, because I I know I heard that from a mile away. Like I was in the kitchen and I heard boo. I was like, oh, that's Paul. So after <laughs> <laughs> that night, we had a meetup in uh, Bellevue, and Terry Myerson and Joe B came, and uh, some, a bunch of other people from Microsoft. But Terry came over to me and he said, I I uh, debated whether I should mention the Seahawks, and uh, I was thinking of you. <laughs> and I said, well. <laughs> You might have heard some subtle booing. That was me. <laughs> yeah, subtle. So. Subtle. That was the greatest thing. Yeah. No, I just, was... boo! It was such an angry <laughs> boo, too, you know? It wasn't... It was... Right. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, let's uh, let's talk about Xbox a little bit. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously, it's going to be the underlining operating system. That's, that's a big upgrade, considering, you know, now, now it's one unified operating system. So there's a lot of questions here. One, unified universal apps. Uh, they've mentioned it, but they really haven't said much about it beyond yep. there's going to yep. be universal apps. Uh, in-game streaming. And it, it, the in-game streaming, which I I, I want to say, uh, you may have alluded to this like a year and a half ago. Yeah, the, uh, Microsoft has been known to have been working on an on-live style gaming service, right? And we originally thought that this thing would be used to make Xbox 360 games play on the Xbox One, and that the games would be streamed from like a data center from yeah. Azure or something. So the the big announcements around Xbox at this event were, well, by the way, I should step back and just say, 
Windows 8 was known ahead of time to be uh, a disaster of epic proportions. They knew. Actually, it doesn't, that doesn't really matter. Actually, that's a fact, but whatever. Um, they the knew Xbox, that it was going to be a disaster? Or? Yes. Okay. Yep. yep, they knew. There was no way. It's like uh, the train is racing down the track. There's no way to stop there it. There are no brakes. You can't, you can't. By the time, it was too late. That has nothing to do with what I was about to say. I apologize. I, <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's completely unrelated to this. Because Xbox One, of course, came out a couple of years after uh, Windows 8. So sorry about that. By the time Xbox One came out, everyone knew Windows 8 was a disaster. It, it was literally a disaster. So they downplayed the fact that Windows 8 was the OS. Windows 8 is the OS under Xbox One. And it, it's literally like Windows 8. It's not Windows, It's not even 8.1. It's, it's Windows 8. It's, 8, yeah. it's Windows 8. It's Hyper-V. It's uh, Dave Cutler and the, the original NT team, NT team did this. The underpinnings of Xbox One today is Windows 8. It, they just don't talk about it because they don't want people to associate it with a disaster. So for for the next update, of course, the big update, they're going to have, you know, they're going to go to Windows 10. And it doesn't mean you're going to get like a Windows 10 start screen like on the PC. It doesn't mean that every single app you have is going to work across. But what it means is that you're going to see more Windows 8, I'm sorry, Windows 10 elements. And, and there's been more work since Xbox One came out to make them more similar. You can have, you know, your own background image and all that kind of stuff on Xbox One today. But... From an OS perspective, I think the biggest deal is this notion of universal apps that can run across all three. And so what they're saying is, first of all, there's no requirement. You know, if you're a developer, you don't have to support this. But if you were to make a Twitter app for Windows, you could uh, have user experiences that made sense on phones and small tablets on PCs and on Xbox One. You could support touch, voice, mouse, keyboard, hand controller, remote control, however you want to do it. And yeah. it opens up that possibility. And so the way it was described to me when we, we had our, you know, we kind of had separate briefings um, as little groups, you know, for each of these things. And I was talking to the Xbox guys and they said, you know, we don't think we're going to have people running Excel on a TV screen, but <laughs> it, it opens up this new screen. Although, by the way, how about PowerPoint on a TV screen? That yeah. actually makes a lot of sense. And so you never know. Um, we'll it's see how that goes. I, I, yeah. it, it's, it's a computer, you know, if you want to oh, do it's it. Literally, it's literally a computer. Yeah. So, could be, could be a great little gaming computer, by the way. Anyway. So now uh, <laughs> now you're going to be able to stream those games uh, to any device so, connected on the same network. All right, well, so it's very specifically. So uh, what you can do is stream Xbox One games to a Windows 10 tablet or PC on the same network, home network typically. Right. So I get the theory here is you're little Johnny and you're playing Call of Duty on the big screen in the living room and your sister and mother or whoever comes in and says, hey, we want to watch TV. You're hogging the TV. You can put down the controller. They can start watching TV. You go in your, you know, bedroom or whatever. Hop onto your tablet, start streaming the game. You pick up right where you left off. Get online, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this kind of goes with the actually, always on mentality. Yep. You know, like when so, this is the the long term vision of this device. When they spoke about always on, people freaked out that this device is always going to be on. It's always going to yep. be pinging. People always freak out about stuff like this. But now, now you're seeing the vision of the idea. You know, yeah. it's always on. Yeah, because you could play it anywhere else. It's just going to sit there. Right. So a bunch of questions around this. Um, first one is, uh, can you do anything else on the Xbox One if someone is streaming a game? They're not saying. They don't know. They haven't profiled this stuff yet. They don't know how this is going to work. Um, it opens up the possibility. Well, what about the other direction? I mean, um, there are a lot of games on the PC that are never going to be ported to Xbox One, right? Um, every game of every version of Call of Duty's before Ghosts is never going to come to Xbox One. Uh, what if we could play those? Yeah, that's you know, a great go question. in the opposite direction. Why not? So, the answer to that one was we are absolutely looking at that. Uh, oh wow! We're not going to say we are going to do it. We are looking at that. Yeah. So then I said, well, okay, but that leads us to the next obvious question, which is the original thing I thought was going to happen here. What about streaming Xbox 360 games to Xbox One? Right? Because the same thing. A lot of 360 games never going to make it forward. A lot yeah. of guys upgraded. Maybe the console dies. They still want to play those games. We are absolutely looking at that. That's great. So, no, again, no yeah. definitive yes, it is happening, but they are absolutely looking at that. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the apps a little bit, the universal yeah. apps. Uh, what do they mean by that? How universal is it? It's not going to be one app. You submit it to the Microsoft ecosystem, and then you just, you know, you've scaled yeah. it. You're talking, you're going to have to still submit it to every ecosystem that exists. That's true. Although they're they're having a single store, so you'll you'll submit multiple EXEs to the same store. Multiple, oh yeah, uh, is how that will work. But uh, the way to think about this is think about how it appears to a developer. And so, as a developer, you're in Visual Studio, 
And in the old days, you would make a, a project, we will call it, and it makes an EXE and it runs on Windows, maybe a desktop app or a command line app or whatever it might be. Um, but you also have this th notion of solutions, and solutions are multi-project projects, I guess. And so uh, you could now go in and say, well, I want, a, I want a project. It's going to be a universal app, and you, you kind of check off the boxes. I want huh. this to run on Windows Phone. I want it to run on... Oh, that's great. Well, actually, well, it will probably, we haven't seen the next version of how this will work. It will probably say something like phone, small tablet, big tablet, PC, Xbox One. And obviously, each of these things has its own uh, user experience uh, uniqueness. They have their own interaction uniqueness. Um, you might have to create a different UI for each one, et cetera. But more and more code can be shared in a single project, essentially, or at least a single solution across these multiple EXEs. And when you uh, publish to the store eventually, you'll publish. It'll be multiple EXEs, but it's the same thing. And so what you'll see, especially between small tablets, phones, and uh, big tablets and PCs, is basically kind of the same app. Like you were talking about like the um, that Action Center notification center that comes in from the side on Windows, yeah. on Windows, on big Windows. That thing is in Windows Phone 2. When you slide down from the top of the screen, you get exactly the same UI. And because, if you think about what that looks like, it's kind of a column. It fits right on the phone screen, right? And, this, and so there, it's a full screen experience. On a PC, it's just a column on the side, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So a lot of the apps that are common to, uh, to Windows Phone and Windows 8.1 today will be are being redone as un single universal apps that work, work on both. And so they're, I don't, I'm not going to get them all off the top of my head, but it's you know calendar, calendar and mail, photos, Xbox, Xbox Music, uh, people. You know, most of them, I think. I don't remember all of them. But, you know, the, the apps we sort of think of as being part of uh, Windows today, the MSN apps, you know, MSN News, Weather, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, Skype, um, all, the, all of the apps, you know. And, yeah. and they'll, they'll kind of, uh, they'll have responsive UIs that will change based on the form factor, uh, based on the platform you're running on, you know, based on if you're in full screen mode or in windowed mode, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when are they going to open up the App Store for Xbox? Because this is something that I've been waiting, right? People constantly ask me, like, oh, why don't you have an yeah. app on, on the in Xbox? And I go, because we're not allowed to have an app in, in Xbox right now. Right. So they haven't announced it yet, but uh, the logical time for that announcement is the Game Developer Conference, uh, which I think is in March. I could have the timing wrong, but um, they're going to have Xbox announcements related to Windows 10 there at Build. Uh, and then, of course, E3 is whenever that is in June. So, I mean, I, we're going to find out over the course of the year. Windows 10 doesn't ship until the end of the year. So I think it's fair to think that that App Store will open up to de developers by the end of the year and that when this thing launches, there'll be a major update for Xbox One and right. then there'll be all the, you know, the PC phone stuff. Uh, now let's talk about the big one. Holograms, okay. Paul! Yeah. So Holy technically, they're not they're not actually holograms. <laughs> but holograms. We're in the future. Yeah. yeah. It's happening. So it's, yeah. Yeah. And it is happening. So uh, having lived through the sort of debacle of Connect, I, I, I watched this demo on stage and I thought, this, geez, this is so clearly like Connect related. And honestly, the way they were setting it up, I thought what they were going to do was have multiple cameras or whatever sensors around the room and they were going to beam it in. They're going to. And it was going to sit. It was going to be there, like, like Yoda. See it, everyone could see it, and yeah. And yeah. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And this is so not applicable to how most people would ever do anything. But it's not. It's a headset. And then I thought, okay, so that's interesting. But here's the thing. So I've used Oculus Rift before, which is a VR headset, right? And when when you use a VR headset, you're kind of uh, enmeshed in this thing. You don't you don't see the room you're in. You just see whatever you see whatever you know, it is. Uh, so you can't do a lot of walking around um, because you'd walk into things and trip over things and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it gives you that kind of motion sickness effect and you can, you know, 3D games, et cetera. Uh, this is different. So this is augmented reality. And, and what you have here are glasses. They're, they're, they're bigger in the sense that they're, you know, taller or whatever and, and go around more than Google Glass. It's not just like a little screen, but it's the whole... It's covering your you know, entire face. It's yeah. like Lady Gaga, yeah. you know, sunglasses. Um, you I think I own around. one of those, actually, Paul. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> so you use it when you drive your IROC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they're not shades. I mean, they're clear. But you uh, you could drive with these things on. You could do anything. I mean, you could walk around. It's no problem. Um, but they can beam images onto the inside of the lenses from next to your eyes, around your eyes, whatever. And those things that they're – the images, the 3D objects that you see 
appear in space in the room you're in and interact with the room. And so if you think about something simple like you're uh, displaying like a, a 3D uh, fire engine that a kid might have, you could, it could be sitting over there on the couch and it's sitting properly on the couch. It appears to be on the couch. And when you walk around it and you view it from different angles, it's, cor- it's always correct. You know, it's, it's, it sure. looks real, stunningly real. Um, in the demo they showed on stage, I was not impressed by this at all. You were not, okay. Uh, later in, in our, under very high security and a l- laborious, you know, kind of process, we got to go through four demos, uh, with this thing. And on one of them, you know, you walk into a room and it looks like this room, there's stuff in it. It's just a room and then it flicks on and you're standing on the surface of Mars. Did, did you have it on? Like, did you, yeah. Are they allowed you well, to wear this? It's a prototype version. Of it. Yeah. So you so actually prototype- wore this thing. Yes. Okay. And, uh, it is. It is the most seamless, photorealistic, unbelievable, perfect thing. I, 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 it was astonishingly good. And you're looking at Mars, and it, it is stunning clarity. And you can, the sky, the rocks, the quality of the rocks, the rover, the footprints. Well, not footprints, but the, rather the tread prints. Um, it, it's astonishing. And, and how, uh, how, well, how good it looks. It doesn't look – is yeah. it is – it, uh, it's real. It, it looks real. It's not. Is it? Is there transparency to it, or does it look like it's there? It looks. No, it was there. Wow. And I, like, you know, I, I, I'm never gonna look. I'm never gonna fly in space. Um, but I feel like I literally was on an. Like I literally feel like I went to another place. Like it was yeah. amazing. Um, th- th- in that particular demo, it was kind of interesting because there's a second part of it where there's a computer on the on a desk, and it's really there. I mean, it's you know, like a desk with a computer. And you use the mouse, you kind of mouse around with the mouse, and the mouse is moving around on the screen. And then he says, now take the, you know, guide it so that, you, you know, in other words, you got to go flying off the edge of the screen. And normally, of course, the mouse cursor kind of hits the edge of the screen, it stops. But the mouse cursor keeps going, and now it's out in space. Wow. And now you can select, select objects that you see, and you're giving commands to the rover so that it will now go to that area and investigate the, you know, take a soil sample or whatever. And when you move the mouse cursor back to the screen, it goes back onto the screen. And it's moving around on the screen again, <laughs> and it is, wow. it's it's kind of you know it sounds it sounds hokey, it sounds stupid. It's you know it was amazing. Um, there was a Minecraft demo where you're in a very simple, smaller room, table, shelves, and everything. There's like a Minecraft uh, castle on it with sheep and everything. Parts of the table are blown away in Minecraft in a sense, and you can look into the hole and see the floor under the table. Wow. You can see the you move around and it's all perfect. It's all in 3D. Um, you can blow things up. You blow a hole in the wall, and bats fly out of it in 3D. And you can see the hole in the wall with the stalactites and everything. And you're looking around and it has depth. And you look up yeah. and down and it's it's there. I mean, it's it's like it's there. I mean, this thing this is the feature of the next Xbox. Yes, but it, there's also so so Mars, right? The, the Mars thing, they, this is an actual thing. JPL and NASA are using this. Like, they're going to use it this year to control the rover. So they're going to go from wow. this crazy, awful system from the 1970s to, like, augmented reality, sci-fi, and it's going to change their lives. But that doesn't impact a lot of people, right? <laughs> not yeah. directly. So it's not hard to imagine that same type of technology being applied to virtual house hunting. Uh, where you're looking at an apartment or home f- without having to travel to the place because you have traveled to the place. Literally, it, w- it yeah. would be that good. Or, um, look, I'm, I'm never going to go to you know Paris or Thailand or Antarctica. But now you can. Now yeah. You can. You know, I could and be it, in the Parthenon, first, you know, and it's yeah. and it's glory. And you, could actually, you could be in the Parthenon as it looks right now. Eventually, yeah. right? It could be real time. So if you have ever thrilled. To the uh, to Street View, the Street View, uh, Google Street View is an amazing thing. You can do it right now. You can probably go to uh, Rio de Janeiro, and it looks like you're standing on the street, and you, you can zip around and move around. But imagine you're standing there now. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the possibilities here are astonishing. And again, I want to be clear about this. I went into this semi mocking it because I've seen Connect, and these are the same guys, and I was not impressed. And I thought this is going to be stupid and there'll be lines and seams and it will lag. And no, it, it was awesome. It was awesome. So, you, do, but do you, in my mind, you know what's running, what, what's happening right now? All I could think of is people are going to buy this. They're no longer going to buy TVs and they're going to lay in bed and watch, you know, their television. By the way, uh, okay. In augmented uh, an ent- reality. Sure. As an entertainment solution. I mean, uh, 
you know, I, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to think of some TV show that's on TV. You're watching Sherlock or something or whatever. You know, TV is kind of a passive thing. You're sitting there on the couch, and it probably still will be for a lot of people. But there, there, there's going to be that possibility of pausing a show and walking around in the scene, you know, yeah. uh, to see it from another angle, or deciding I want to see it from another angle, or, or football games where you could walk around the stadium and view it from the place you want to see it from, you know. I mean, it's it is. Again, it's a first step. Um, uh, you know, a lot of real time stuff. How, probably. I mean, they said that they're they're expecting to ship this with Windows 10 around the same time yeah. period. So yeah. they are. They said fa- NASA will be deploying this this year. They're okay. going to use it. So they're far they're they're far along with the development of this device. Yeah, it's real. I mean, yeah. and that's the point. This is not like canned demo. Like, and that was the thing. In in, in a lot of the demos we did. We interacted with another person in real time, and it was another person. It wasn't a canned thing. He's talking to you, and you're answering him, and he's responding based on how you're answering, and you're doing things that are unique to this session. Like it's not – I mean, obviously, we all kind of did the same basic stuff, but um, where I decided to, to walk and look and, and you know bend over and, and examine things was unique to me. It was because I wanted to do certain things. When someone else did the same demo, they did different things slightly. I mean, they did many of the same things. Um, because they want you to see certain aspects of it, of course. Um, you know, there. Uh, I told you how beautiful the Mars landscape was. You know, in, in some, of, we went to three different places on Mars, and in one place, you, if you, when you look closely at like a hill, you could see it was kind of low resolution compared to most of it. And one of the things they can do is you basically mark areas of the hill, and now they'll get more footage of that area, both from satellites and from the rover. They'll combine that to get a better, complete picture of that area of Mars. Now, of course, on the planet Earth, that's very easy to do. And so it's not hard to imagine these kind of city things I'm talking about coming together very quickly. Yeah. Uh, it's this like is... the scene in The Matrix. Remember, they walk around and the people stop moving and, you know, You're he's trying to, to teach do that. It's, that's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, this... it's, it's amazing to see it in, because it's not a science fiction movie. Like, it's, it's there. God, I wonder how much this thing is going to cost. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it's it's from what I see. Uh, I, I showed it to Jess. I was like, "Look at this!" And yeah. it's like, "It's like, oh, but this isn't real." I'm like, "No, it's real. Like, it's <laughs> it's it's happening." It's like, I, and I, and that's where I got the Netflix thing. She's like, "So you could be watching TV, and I could put this thing on, and it'll overlap the television that we have, and I can watch Netflix on there." I'm like, "Yeah, we're we're talking about Mars. NASA's going to be using it, but yeah, you could do that too. You could use it for Netflix. Yeah, you have you want to watch soap operas? Go yeah, so yeah, it's you, fine. You could go to Mars. You could watch soap operas." <laughs> I want to go. I want to go to the moon and watch it. Uh, this is really cool. This is really cool. So, um, I, I mean, the the media reception to this event was very positive for Microsoft. Yeah, I think this was the big home run for these guys that they yeah. needed badly. Um, I mean, this this is the definition of the new Microsoft, right? This is the new leadership. This is the new restructuring that went on for a while. Uh, this is the overall effect of what's happening. They they're really looking to become. Not a legacy company like an IBM, but an innovative well, company like what Apple was, was maybe a couple of years ago. Stuff. So you think about Windows 10. I've been saying this for a long time. I mean, this is going to be a great upgrade for traditional PC users, touch tablet devices, whatever, phones, yeah, Xbox One. Great. But I mean, we're talking about a very established market here, right? I mean, so yeah. none of this stuff is uh, the fact that they released a great upgrade for Windows 7 isn't going to change the world. It's going to please their current customers. That's great. Um, I think the point of um, other initiatives, you know, Internet of Things in particular, which we didn't hear a lot about here, but I think they mentioned it, though. They I, mentioned yeah. it, but I, I think we're going to hear much more at Build because it's kind of a developer topic. It's early days. Um, that to a lesser extent, because that is a lot about that pervasiveness of computing that we always talk about. But this augmented reality, which came out of left field, um, I think is an area where they can lead. And they, I, I can't remember how he said it, but you talk about user interface paradigms. Uh, Steve Ballmer admitted that they missed the boat on mobile. They missed the boat on multi-touch. They just, I mean, they had solutions in those uh, markets. And in fact, they had them before my, Apple did, but they didn't control those markets. And so they're always going to be kind of an also ran there. This is a chance for them to grab something new. And the, the funny thing is, uh, Mary Jo Foley and others had been reporting for a while that Microsoft was working on this gaming headset um, uh, that began with an F. Okay, it was, it was uh, Project F internally. Um, th- they moved that into this um, 
HoloLens product uh, within the last year, and it became, I think it was called Plan, Plan B or Project B or whatever, um, because Satya Nadella saw this and said, you are way too limited in what you're doing with this. This is life-changing. You, this needs to be applied out way past games. And now you see this NASA thing, and you kind of see the benefit of that kind of a vision where, um, you know, games would have been neat, but, you know, Oculus Rift, right, this giant, like, uh, Stormtrooper helmet thing you put on your head, like, it's good for games. And, by the way, yeah. it would be okay for those virtual walkthroughs, I guess, as well, especially if the display technology improved. But, you know, augmented reality is like, you know, it's like going from 2D to 3D. I mean, it's 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 a completely different uh, thing, and it's 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 a more profound thing, you know, than a gaming VR he- he- you know headset. Uh, by the way, Microsoft just released their uh, latest build of Windows 10. Okay, I gotta go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, it was really perfect am. time. It's one. O- it's one o'clock. We gotta go anyway. But uh, yeah. just- by the way, I just I, I just wanted to say I did say yeah. it would be on Friday. Uh, you were right again. <laughs> Paul's always right. Uh, Therot.com. Uh, Therot.com, Paul's new website. Great content going up there. Uh, how has the transition been this week? Because I know you guys went live on Tuesday, officially. Yeah, it's, um, it's you know, it's been good, mostly, honestly. I mean, it's just, uh, obviously, you start a new site, and it is, um, it's stressful, and it's, you know, there are glitches, and, you know, and the guys who are doing this are fantastic, and they're going to, you know, fix the problems and all that. And so people are giving me a lot of feedback. It's been really tough this week because I've been away and busy, busy, busy. But um, we are, um, you know, we're getting there. So it's, it's been going great. We had, uh, and I, you know, a bunch of guys from Microsoft too were really cool. And um, uh, Jeff, uh, you know, Jeff thought, James yeah. gave us a shout out a little while ago <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's a, an old friend and uh, now we're, Co-worker. <laughs> so uh just just yeah. one quick note if apple had come out with this device i feel like yep. people would be convulsing speaking in tongues throwing their bra and oh, underwear absolutely. at the yeah, stage there's, there's absolutely zero it would be zero like the battle. beatles coming to america you know yeah <laughs> just just yep. just let, let's think about that you know for a second uh Therot. oh, absolutely therot.com uh hey guys you can subscribe to his newsletter i'm subscribed to his newsletter and let me tell you paul I, I, I curse at it every day because I think you're actually sending me an email and I'll see Paul throw out. I'm like, oh, Paul's writing to me and it's your newsletter. So I get this every day. Now I've conditioned myself that it's a newsletter and it's not Paul writing me an email today. Uh, yesterday when I was trying to track you down during this event, I emailed you and I got an email from Paul throw I'm like, oh, he's finally, finally. <laughs> and it's your newsletter. Uh, you can subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, great stuff on there. Uh, support Paul. Paul also does a phenomenal show on the Twit Network, Windows Weekly, every Tuesday with Mary Jo Foley and Leo Laporte. Uh, guys, you could, you could, if you want to support the show, we're not doing our bonus show because Paul needs to get out of here right now, but you can support us by going to patreon.com slash whatthetech. That's patreon.com, whatthetech. Whatever you want to donate, we accept. Every penny counts, uh, and it helps us to do the show at uh, limited ads. We like to keep it to one ad. Uh, also, uh, if, you, if you're buying stuff on Amazon, you could use my link gfk.co slash Amazon, and uh, it helps us out making big purchases here in the studio. We just upgraded some stuff. Uh, we got new cables. We're getting another camera in here. So uh, it's a big help for us. And uh, anything else, Paul? Anything you want to plug? <laughs> that's it? Nothing? No, I, that's, you know, it's, I, I just ask people to, oh, I should say, I, I, there's one thing. Um, uh, please sign up for the newsletter. It's free. And uh, it's basically a... Um, you know, rundown of what's happened on the site in the past 24 hours, whatever that kind of thing. Um, we're going to have a contest uh, soon. It's um, to get uh, versions of that, you know, throat.com mug uh, coffee cup. Um, and we have uh, many, many of those to give away. Oh, my God. I need one of those, and I need the throat shirt. <laughs> yeah. So eventually, I think we're going to have those available for sale as well. I think for now, it's just kind of a promotion thing. So you're wearing uh, it right now. You're wearing the shirt right oh, now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't even see it. I'm, yeah, there it is. <laughs> I got my, my shirt, yeah. I want that. So. Yeah, so I think we will sell like logo mar- like shirts and laptop stickers and stuff. Can mine say but, Zarian? Mm, no. With the Z <laughs> with the Microsoft logo? Yeah, no, no. You know what? When I come up with Zarian.com, my all Microsoft news site, that'll be my logo. <laughs> It'll be a Z. Nice. <laughs> uh, yes, that's awesome. I really want the mug, so uh, <laughs> people should keep out. I-, I got so many comments about the freaking mugs. 
I got so many emails saying like, hey, Andrew, do you know if I could buy the mugs? Where can I buy the mugs? Right. They saw uh, it on your... Soon. Yeah, soon. Soon. It's going to be in my... Yeah, the new side business. Yeah. Selling mugs Selling and t-shirts. So, yes. Out of the back of a van. Cafepress.com or something. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, that's it for this week. Uh, We'll see you on Tuesday. Back to our regular schedule. Uh, Until next time, guys. Uh, Bye-bye for now.